Welcome, everyone. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to begin with prayer. Is somebody willing to provide a prayer? Please. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Uh, I do have this handout on immunoassays. Uh, if anybody would like a hard copy, please raise your hand and the PAs will bring them around. Let me um, let me update you on the exam. Uh, it is being graded and some scores, some scores have appeared in learning solutions, correct? But, but these are only partial, partial scores for the uh, written portion of the exam. So please, uh, please be patient. Uh, these are not your final total points for um, for that portion of the exam that was written. This, I'm afraid it's a little bit misleading at the moment, but uh, please be patient. The uh, TAs are working hard to do this, but it's a lot of work to uh, to get these graded. <clears throat> are there questions? Okay, um, we are going to uh, talk briefly in, in sort of very general terms about transcription factors. And we're going to spend a few minutes on that. And then we're going to move on to uh, chapter 10 and talk about lipids. Uh, lipids is a extremely broad category of biomolecules. The sort of common unifying feature of lipids is that they are hydrophobic. <laughs> and so that, uh, that includes a lot of uh, different types of molecules. Some of these have rather pedestrian functions, some of them much more sophisticated functions. Those with more sophisticated functions, we will probably spend a little more time with, but we will uh, move over these today. All right, so I'm going to move away from uh, the screen, the board here, and uh, talk uh, about transcription factors briefly. I'm I'm no expert on transcription factors, but they do represent this interesting intersection between proteins and nucleic acids, specifically double-stranded DNA. And uh, so they, they, embody, um, they embody this, this same set of requirements to allow for productive interactions between double-stranded DNA a gene and uh, this transcription factor, this protein that is meant to regulate transcription. So that, in a nutshell, is sort of what tr transcriptions do, <clears throat> transcription factors do. They have the ability, well, each one uh, does things differently. <clears throat> the same transcription factor can upregulate certain genes and actually downregulate other genes. We will see this. Uh, we're going to have a special topic here in, in a few 
lectures uh, about cortisol in Cushing's disease, and uh, quite uh, and, and it's quite remarkable that uh, cortisol, when bound to its receptor, which becomes a transcription factor, is able to upregulate as many as maybe 30 different genes, and at the same time downregulates probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 genes. So profound, broad uh, spectrum of effects, but quite different from gene to gene. And all of the uh, particulars as to how something is upregulated or downregulated is really beyond um, the time that we have to consider this. And so, but you know, I thought it would be interesting to at least consider how it is that transcription factors bind to uh, to genes, to double-stranded DNA, and um, consider just again the level of complexity that this represents. Um, <clears throat> the binding site for a transcription factor is typically upstream of uh, the coding region of a gene. And this represents a specific sequence of bases. Uh, transcription factors typically bind in the major group can also have binding, uh, can be large enough to have uh, portions of the same transcription factor bind in the minor group. Um, so, and, and again, each, each particular transcription factor is going to act uh, interact with the double-stranded DNA, DNA in slightly different ways. The binding of the transcription factor then typically leads to changes in the conformation, the structure of the double-stranded DNA. There is this factor then that sits on the DNA, and in turn, this often leads to the recruitment of other proteins to the same site. And it's these other proteins then that have the ability to increase uh, the transcription of a gene or decrease the transcription of a gene. So uh, in this slide, Uh, this just starts to give you a hint at, uh, at what is going on as a transcription factor binds. You can see um, up at the top in green here, we have our transcription factor. So this would be um, an amino acid uh, that is part of that transcription factor. And you can see here's a base pair um, that is somewhere between the major and minor group. It's a little unclear as to what this represents, but you can see that there are favorable interactions between the bases or, and uh, this particular amino acid. Uh, this, again, just gives you some examples of how specific a specific series of base, base pairs uh, can interact with protein uh, amino acids, so the, and transcription factor amino acids. And you don't have to remember how these particular interactions take place, but I'm trying to give you the sense that there, there is complementary chemistry between the bases of the double-stranded DNA and specific amino acids. In fact, the amino acids have to be in a specific order in order to favorably interact with the bases, and the bases have to be in a specific order to favorably interact with the transcription factor. In addition to having these favorable chemical interactions, the actual shape of the uh, double-stranded DNA uh, matters. And uh, while it's hard to pick out here, there are features of this that are going to be very important. Where you see the 
red uh, atoms here in the um, in the uh, DNA. And this looks like it might be maybe the major group. You'll see that there are um, possibilities then for hydrogen bonding with an amine uh, uh, or some other, um, some uh, probably an amine on the um, on an amino acid that's part of the transcription factor. Uh, here's another set. Notice here we have a methyl group, and that methyl group occupies space. And so, if we're going to have complementary favorable interactions between protein and DNA, there has to be accommodation for the topography of the DNA, as well as the topography, the overall shape of the surface of the protein. And this can get very complicated. I'm gonna talk about briefly about one particular type of transcription factor, or at least one motif found in transcription factors. This is a fairly common one and it's called a zinc finger. Um, it's a little hard to pick out exactly what's going on in this particular um, slide, but it turns out that there is in fact a zinc ion, let me circle it here, and again down here, that is, um, uh, is held in place by interactions with protein uh, amino acid side groups, specifically sulfhydryl groups on cysteines and the imidazole rings on histidines uh, actually favorably interact with the zinc ion, this is zinc plus two. Again, we talk about transition metal, we talk about transition metal bonds with iron. The zinc um, has a um, coordination sphere that allows for four uh, bonding interactions. And so the zinc then brings together the side groups of the amino acids, the cysteines and the histidines, and creates a certain shape. Uh, it is common to have this, this uh, arrangement up here at the top, beta sheet turn, beta sheet. So we have beta sheet, it follows out here, beta sheet turn, and then the alpha helix. And so this beta sheet turn, beta sheet turn, alpha helix, is a common motif or a common arrangement of the zinc finger transcription factors. So it is not, so what you have to understand is that this zinc finger is part of a much larger protein. Uh, so there can be, uh, there can be literally many, many, many different proteins that participate as transcription factors that share this uh, way of interacting with the double-stranded DNA. Uh, so this is, uh, again, a little hard to follow, but this is now the, um, if you, uh, this is now a zinc finger uh, transcription factor interacting with double-stranded DNAs. A little bit hard to figure out where everything is, but uh, in this particular case, we can see the, these green dots here uh, are copies of zinc. And we see the, this, uh, these alpha helices sometimes placed in the major groove. Uh, sometimes they seem to be somewhat outside the double-stranded DNA. It's a little bit hard to see this in two dimensions. But what this implies is that we have now this ability to create a shape uh, and a surface with uh, particular amino acid side groups positioned right where they need to be to interact with a very specific uh, series of bases in double-stranded DNA. They have to bind at just exactly the right place to be able to facilitate an increase or decrease in transcription. 
Uh, maybe this one gives you a little bit clearer. So here we can see that this seems to be fit into this groove. That is to say that there are bonding interactions between amino acid side groups and bases on the double-stranded DNA. This one's even better. Uh, so this is another zinc finger uh, transcription factor. You don't need to remember which particular um, this transcription factor is, but here, here's a zinc here, here's a zinc here and here. And it looks like, it looks like now the zinc ion is interacting both with uh, amino acid side groups, histidines, cysteines, as well as the zinc also interacting with bases that are at the right location with the right sequence in the double-stranded DNA. So this, there is a specific sequence of, for the protein amino acid. I mean, the amino acid sequence for the protein. So we see a serine, aspartate, asparagine, arginine, and we have the specific base sequence of GACC. Uh, and these then, will always be able to interact. And this sequence of bases has to occur at the right place uh, within the double-stranded DNA. It has to be close enough to the, 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 the beginning of trans, uh, transcription um, to be able to facilitate an increase in the transcription of a gene. So very, very, sophisticated um, interactions, very sophisticated sh uh, shape uh, recognition, size recognition for both the double-stranded DNA and the protein. And the protein in turn is to be able to facilitate recruitment of other proteins to the same site with the desired outcome of increasing regulation or decreasing regulation a specific genes. Okay, we won't do a lot more of this. Let me, um, this represents now a really enormous amount of words, but what this is, is effectively a catalog. Uh, so these three base sequences uh, as shown throughout this uh, thing. So uh, interact with very specific amino acid sequences we'll see that the amino acids that interact specifically uh, with the bases are underlined. So, so, um, so this one over here, we see that the R is underlined and we have this underlined and over here. And so there is really a very predictable pattern of base uh, of these three base sequences and a very predictable sequence of amino acids that will interact together. So this is talking about now chemistry. It doesn't fully describe the shape of the protein or the shape of the double-stranded DNA. But nevertheless, this speaks to the issue uh, of how does a particular transcription factor recognized double-stranded DNA. So here's a cartoon of a zinc finger uh, area. That's based on this, you can see that these fingers arise as the uh, protein binds zinc. These in turn can be intercalated or inserted into features of the double-stranded DNA. And here's one more. This is a different transcription factor, not a zinc finger one. But if you look here on the right, the upper right, you can see the double-stranded DNA fits right into this, uh, into a trough that is present in the protein. And again, there have to be these favorable interactions to allow this to take place. And the protein in turn is able to bring about a certain <clears throat> um, conformational change 
or has the ability to recruit other proteins to this site of uh, where the complex has been formed. Okay. I think that's, uh, again, it kind of, you, it tries to show you how, how specific bases will interact with specific amino acid side groups. Anyway, are there questions? Uh, we're really not going into a lot of detail, but it is, it is um, an interesting intersection between now nucleic acids and proteins. Yes. No. I, I don't know if people heard the question. So there are specific examples given. You don't need to know the specific examples. You need to know the general concepts behind transcription factors. Yes. Yeah. I believe that the underlying uh, letters represent am specific amino acids that interact with the uh, the three base sequence. Okay, at least that was my understanding of the uh, tables. Someone else had a hand up. Yes. So are these things are they like No, no, there are. So the P53, which is in the last couple of slides, doesn't use zinc. Uh, it has, it, it, it surrounds now the double-stranded DNA rather than with the zinc finger, typically you have at least one alpha helix that sits in a major groove and, and so forth. So each transcription factor actually often has its own shape. It will have its own amino acid sequence that will in interact with a specific base uh, sequence within the double-stranded DNA. So they're highly specific, highly specialized uh, interactions that happen. Highly varied, um, you know, every gene in our body is pretty much regulated and some of them are regulated by many different transcription factors. Dr. Graves. Yes, sir. What exactly is the purpose of the zinc ion? Just to transform the shape of the protein so it will be able to attach to the double helix? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it appears that in uh, a number of cases that uh, the, the presence of the zinc causes a change in the shape of the protein to allow for favorable interaction uh, with the double-stranded DNA. In one of those slides, there was a suggestion that the zinc actually represents a, a, a feature to which both the protein and the DNA were bound. So there it, it uh, acts as a mediator of the binding between the pro transcription factor and the double-stranded DNA. But I would think of it primarily as creating the appropriate shape to allow for the transcription factor to interact with uh, the double-stranded DNA. So um, these sites on the gene, okay, so this is the non-coding portion of the gene, uh, the gene are often uh, called uh, things like horm uh, the hormone response element or it will be the, uh, uh, they have a number of different names for the site on the DNA, but it is a specific site. And often these are, I think something like 30 base pair uh, above the uh, start site for uh, the transcription. Okay, we're gonna shift gears now. And we're going to talk about, or begin talking about this very broad category of biological molecules turned lipids. As I mentioned, the common unifying factor for these is not their function, is not their shape, uh, it is not their composition, but it is that they are hydrophobic. They are, uh, they are considered to be uh, oil-soluble uh, kinds of compounds that are found in the body. 
These are not proteins. They're not made of, up, of, up of amino acids. Um, although some proteins will be modified with lipid. These are not uh, carbohydrates. They're not made up of those sugar rings, uh, but sometimes there will be combinations of both lipid and carbohydrate. So again, uh, there are complexities in, uh, in the actual composition of complexes or biomolecules that we will find in nature. So a lot of these, when we think about lipids, we include fats. Fats are a, uh, are a form, uh, a chemical form of energy. So uh, they are high in calories. They are very hydrophobic. They don't require water. Consequently, they're quite compact. Per gram, uh, they uh, tend to have about three times the calories of carbohydrates or proteins. So they, uh, because they are typically in a more reduced state, which is, which also makes them uh, more hydrophobic. Uh, fat can act, serve as insulation. So you think of seals and whales and uh, they can serve as waterproofing. So waxes on the feathers of ducks and so forth, uh, on leaves actually. Uh, they are the molecules that make up primarily, almost exclusively, um, the membranes, both the cell membrane and the membranes of organelles within the cell. But some of these are also uh, very potent regulatory compounds, signaling molecules. So we'll talk a little bit about steroid hormones. We'll talk about uh, prostaglandins. These, uh, something like prostaglandins are extremely potent compounds uh, that carry out really important functions in our body. All right. Um, so when we talk about fats, we're really talking about the, uh, these triacyl glycerol molecules. Um, so glycerol, as you can see at the top of the slide, is this, oops, um, is this three carbon uh, species that has three hydroxyl groups associated with it. And in the context of fats, these three hydroxyl groups are esterified with three fatty acids. The fatty acids can differ in their chain length they can be from anything from an acetate up to, I think probably about 26 carbons is the longest I've ever seen. The fatty acids can have different amounts of unsaturation. So animal fat tends to have a higher proportion of saturated fatty acids that are appended to the glycerol molecule. Whereas plant oils, uh, often have more unsaturation associated with them. So we talk about um, saturated fats and unsaturated fats. In reality, they, there's a real mix of both saturated and unsaturated fatty acids in both plants and animals. It's just that the proportion of saturated fatty acids is higher in animals and is uh, more unsaturated in plants. Okay, so these are now fuel molecules. These are not, uh, these are not typically what make up cell membranes. These are ingested, absorbed uh, as individual fatty acids. So you have to remove them from the glycerol backbone, but they're absorbed and then they are um, used as a source of energy within an animal or plant. So this uh, table uh, indicates the uh, not all of it, uh, not all of the fatty uh, fatty acids by any means, but common fatty acids. And so, as I wrote on the board, I would like you to know 
sort of the common names. So if we look over here, this group here, if you could kind of know the common names for fatty acids, 16 carbons and longer. So palmitic acid being uh, saturated, uh, 16 carbon fatty acid. You'll see down here we have stearic acid. This is, um, is if I can put the cursor in. Stearic acid, well, it's underneath. Again, it's 18 carbons. Um, it is found abundantly in meat. Um, and so if you think about it, uh, steric, the steric means hard fat. Uh, if you think about it, animal fat, like on a steak or something like that, really does, is set up and uh, is a solid at room temperature. Something like uh, oleic acid, which has one double bond uh, in it and 18 carbons, is uh, a liquid at room temperature, but if you put it in the fridge, your olive oil will set up, okay? It will become kind of hardened. Uh, yes? So Dr. Allen's bank spores, which one more energy stuff or is it about the same? Well, the unsaturated fats will have slightly less energy because they are slightly more oxidized than their saturated cousins. And we'll, we'll see that. Uh, we'll talk about this in a later chapter. Um, so, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, there, there, there is um, guidance provided by many different medical groups, diet, dietary uh, guidance suggesting that unsaturated fatty acids on the whole are more um, healthy, at least for cardiovascular health, than our saturated fatty acids. Okay. You'll notice that the more unsaturation, the lower the melting point. And so uh, if you kind of look over to this column next to their names, you'll see that uh, the saturated fatty acids, as mentioned, are going to be solids at room temperature. In fact, you'd have to heat them quite a, quite a bit to get them to melt and form liquids. Uh, on the other hand, you can see that the unsaturated fatty acids, especially the polyunsaturated fatty acids, have very low melting points. Hey, Dr. Graves. Yes. Just to be clear on that last slide, do we just need to know their names and how long the chain is, or do you want us to know how long, like the placement how of the long, double bonds or anything else? Yeah, you need to know the chain length and the number of double bonds and the common name. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so uh, this just gives you a sense. The saturated fatty acids are fairly linear. Uh, those with double, uh, with unsaturation have these um, sort of bends in them. Uh, this gives you a sense of something, uh, if we look at olive oil, uh, the, it's a little hard to see, but the uh, saturated is shown in yellow. So B fat is about 50% saturated fats and about uh, slightly less than half with unsaturated fatty acids, but longer ones. Um, you'll see that olive oil, which is uh, has a lot of oleic acid, oleic means olive, uh, so its oil is very uh, much more uh, unsaturated and typically with oleic acid, which has one double bond. Uh, butter is kind of in between uh, and not surprisingly, uh, butter, if you leave it out on a hot day on the table, will begin to melt. Uh, yeah, however, if you put it in the fridge, it will be a solid. Okay. We are now going to talk about membrane lipids, and uh, that may be about what we get to today. So these membrane lipids, um, 
uh, <clears throat> often have a polar or charged head group, either a hydroxyl, in some cases a sugar, in some cases a phosphate. Sometimes we're modifying triglycerides, so the so the triacylglycerol, so three acyl groups, three fat groups, modifying the glycerol, triacylglycerols are also called triglycerides. So if you go get your blood tested for cholesterol, they'll measure your triglycerides as well as the um, amount of cholesterol that's in your blood. So this is their general structure. You still have the glycerol backbone. Uh, you have this phosphate group and you have the uh, two available hydroxyl groups. These are going to be modified with fatty acids. It turns out that uh, the one hydroxyl group is going to be primarily modified with saturated fatty acids, okay? So the one hydroxyl, typically you'll have a, fatty, a saturated fatty acid present there. The two hydroxyl typically is modified with an unsaturated fatty acid. And in particular, there's usually a high level of um, arachidonic acid that is present on the two hydroxyl group on the inner leaf of uh, the cell membrane. This phosphate group typically is further modified. The phosphate is going to be esterified often with an amino alcohol. And we'll see some of these in the next slide. This is a little hard to follow. You don't need to know the specific names here, but you should know that uh, when we talk about uh, glycerol phospholipids, we are talking about a glycerol molecule with two fatty acids present and the phosphate modified with typically a uh, amino alcohol. So let's just focus here on choline. <clears throat> so choline has a hydroxyl group out here. I can, this is really hard. Okay, so here's, think of there being a hydro, choline has a hydroxyl group. It has this tertiary amine at the other end. So it has a, uh, a nitrogen with three methyl groups attached permanently positively charged. And the hydroxyl group is going to form a phosphoester bond with the phosphate of this phospholipid. So the phosphate is a bridge between the glycerol and the choline. We have uh, glycerol phosphocholines. They are probably the largest and most abundant group of membrane lipids. We also have glycerol uh, phosphoserines, glycerol phosphoethanolamines. Occasionally we'll have uh, other constituents on there. Let me just point out that sort of an unusual one is this uh, inositol. Uh, we'll talk more about this uh, next time. But inositol looks like a sugar, but it's not really a sugar. It is a cyclohexane ring with lots of hydroxyl groups uh, modifying that ring. And additionally, it has phosphates on the four and five um, hydroxyl groups of the inositol ring. It turns out that if you cleave this in a certain way where you leave the phosphate on the inositol, this, uh, this <clears throat> triphosphate, 1,4,5-phosphoinositol, uh, this is an extraordinarily potent regulating compound. Uh, it has really profound activity inside of cells uh, when it's released. Okay, <clears throat> so one broad category then of membrane lipids <clears throat> are the glycerol phospholipids. Here's an unusual one that is found in lower organisms. <clears throat> cholesterol is found in cell membranes. Cholesterol esters are found in cell membranes. 
We'll talk a little bit more about those uh, at a later time. The next big category of membrane lipids are the sphingolipids. Sphingosine is a peculiar uh, long chain amino alcohol. If you look at the pink up here at the top, you'll see that this is um, the sphingosine. So you can see that it is a long hydrocarbon chain. Uh, in fact, its length sort of approximates a fatty acid, but it differs in that it has this one hydroxyl group. So this is, uh, is starts off as a hydroxyl. It has this amine group on the two carbon, and it has, oops, sorry, has this uh, hydroxyl group on the three. Oops, I lost that. Okay. Uh, up here. It has this three hydroxyl group. Now, the two amine group is uh, almost always modified with a fatty acid. So the long chain of sphingosine approximates, if you will, a fatty acid, simply because it's very hydrophobic and it's long. The amine group, the two amine, is modified with a fatty acid. And so in some ways, the sphingolipids look like, uh, or can look like, the glycerol phospholipids. They have two very long hydrophobic chains, and then they have the head group. This head group can uh, often be a phosphate. And so uh, these are, <clears throat> this particular category of sphingolipid is, is termed sphingomyelins, okay? So they have choline, phosphate, sphingosine with one fatty acid on the amine. I, it's going to be important to remember these categories. So the, the uh, glycerol phospholipids is just glycerol phospholipids. If we have just the bare hydroxyl, that is a ceramide, but the majority of sphingolipids are these sphingomyelins. As the name suggests, these were first isolated from the myelin sheath. So these lipids are found more abundantly in those particular. Uh, neural tissues. The hydroxyl group here at the one, where this X is, can also have a single sugar attached to it. So these would be neutral uh, uh, lipids. There's no phosphate with charge on it. Uh, and uh, we can have, if we have a single sugar, glucose or galactose, these are called cerebrosides, okay? So buried down here, if you look, uh, is this, where are you, there you are. Okay. Cerebroside, right down here, okay? So single sugar, glucose, the lactose, modifying the head group of the sphingosine gives us cerebrosides. If we have two to three neutral sugars, unbranched, um, or four, I guess, anywhere from two to four sugars unbranched, uh, a, a two to four appending that same hydroxyl group. These are called globocytes. And finally, uh, the, the most complicated of these has a polysaccharide addition. These are typically branched, and they often have acidic acids, specifically sialic acid attached to them. The these are termed gangliosides, and the gangliosides are signaling molecules. So they're going to be placed on the outside, the outer layer of the membrane bilayer. They're going to be on the outer layer with this carbohydrate piece projected outward. These are binding sites, recognition sites, receptors, and play a very important role in cell signaling uh, and sometimes cell-cell interactions. 
When we talk about blood groups, ABO, we're talking about different ganglioside's on the external surface of red blood cells. Okay, so for glycerol phospholipids, there's just glycerol phospholipids, but for the sphingolipids, there are ceramides, just the hydroxyl. There are the sphingomyelins, which have a phosphate and choline. There are the uh, cerebrosides with a single sugar attached to the hydroxyl, uh, typically glucose or galactose. There are the globosides that have two to four unbranched neutral sugars attached. And then we have the gangliosides with branch, potentially carbohydrates, acidic sugars, much larger arrays that extend far beyond the cell surface, allowing for interaction with the uh, outside world. Okay, we're gonna end it here. Questions? Yes? These will be asked about on the exam. You should know the basic structure of these. You don't have to draw anything, although that would be fun. Maybe you can impress your mother-in-law if you could draw a sphingosine, but probably not. Anyway. Yes, go ahead. The lactose, yeah, so for cerebroside, yeah. Yes? So the sphingolipids are more abundantly found, they're found everywhere, but they are more abundantly found in neural, uh, neural tissues. Axons, brain matter, you know, these are uh, frequently found there. Why? Um, that I can't answer for you. I mean, I, there are undoubtedly are reasons, but I'm not exactly sure what they are. I'm not sure if it's even known specifically how, what their specific role is in these, uh, making coatings for these neurologic cells. Other questions? Okay, let me move this story forward. Uh, so I had gone off to basic training. My first Sunday there, I was in this holding unit, no chain of command, no, nobody to even ask. That first Sunday came, the first Sunday went, and I was unable to get to church. The second, uh, the, the day after that Sunday, I was assigned to a basic training unit. And I approached my platoon sergeant and asked him if, if I could go to church. And he arranged for me to have a base pass, which allowed me to leave my company area and go off to church. And there was uh, actually a list of churches and church services that the uh, fort uh, had prepared and was posted on the uh, headquarters bulletin board. And so I found that I, I, uh, it indicated a certain building and a certain time and I went off there and I found no meeting. I don't know that I found the building, but I wandered all over uh, Fort Jackson for a couple hours and gave up and came back to my base. And so the next Monday, my platoon sergeant asked me how church was. Uh, and I was embarrassed, but told him that I was unable to find it. And uh, so he said, well, look, this is what I'm gonna do. I said, next Sunday, I will come, I'll drive on the base and I will drive you to this building so that you can go to church. I mean, this is huge. <laughs> This is his only day off, and he's going to come back on base and actually help me out. And just very, very kind. Uh, he was an exception, I have to say, in terms of the sergeants uh, and other military personnel. By the end of this uh, next that next week, I was desperate to go to church. I mean, it was it was very punishing to uh, go through basic training. They made it intentionally punishing to go through basic training. And so I was, uh, I was desperate to go to church. Sure enough, my uh, platoon sergeant came, he picked me up, he drove over, we went to a building, and there was nobody there. And so we just walked around, waited for a while, and uh, 
it was clear that nobody uh, was having a meeting at, at this particular building. But after a couple minutes, this car pulled up and uh, a, a gentleman in just civilian clothes got out and he said something to the effect, you boys want to go to Mormon services? And I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, anyway, long story short, they're not being held on base any longer. They're being held in Columbia. And I will come pick you up next Sunday to take you to church. So I was discouraged, but I actually had met somebody from the church and things looked more hopeful. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh, absolutely nothing. That was, there was even 